The earliest recollection I have of the Invisible Man is seeing the iconography of that character, the trench coat, the hat, the sunglasses. It was exciting to think about what I could do with this character and how I could stretch him a little bit. I think the most important thing is how do you make it current, how do you make it relevant to today, and that's what Lee really did with Invisible Man. You know, if you were making an Invisible Man movie, you would make it from the point of view of his victim. A woman who escapes from her abusive partner in the middle of the night and then finds out he's killed himself but doesn't quite believe it, especially when mysterious things start happening. I felt that there were a lot of elements about that power that had not been exploited in the way that I would like to see them be exploited. It was important for me that invisibility be something the audience could accept. I didn't want anybody drinking a potion and then just disappearing. I wanted it to be something that was grounded in reality. I decided to approach it from a technological standpoint. I did a bit of research in how invisibility could be achieved. Usually it starts with military tech. You know, they're developing some sort of camouflage for soldiers that allows them to be invisible. I wanted this to at least feel grounded in reality. And I knew that I had to exploit his power in a ruthless way. What? <laughs> Horror movies are so functional, they have this one job to scare people. And so that's always the number one goal. And then as you're writing, all this stuff starts to bleed into it. When I'm writing a film, I don't like to approach it from the angle of a theme or a message. I like to put the plot down on paper and see what comes out. I didn't cycle through 10 different versions of this story. It really almost appeared fully formed in terms of a victim being stalked by the Invisible Man. Any time you are making a film that is not entirely your own, it is based on some sort of intellectual property that is beloved in some way, there's a pressure there. So you do have to tread carefully, and, and I was very aware of that and respectful and reverent of the character, but at the same time, I realised that I had to forget about all that reverence to make a good movie. And in that way, I'll, you know, honour the character. Where are you? I think it's the right time for this movie to be remade, given that we are able to be invisible now. We can hide behind our keyboards and our screens, and you can pretty much torment anybody. You can say whatever you want, there's no accountability. They're anonymous. They can do whatever they want. You get to see the true essence of a human. Action! You think you're living out a BB? So I'm gonna truly teach you something. Lee really did write a very clear emotional through line for this character. He also has an incredible knowledge of the genre and a love for it, a true passion for it. Stop. It's always great when you have a director who's really excited not only about the project, but about the actors. So we can just feel relaxed and just, you know, do the job that we want to do and take risks that we want to take without feeling inhibited. We need to see people that we see in life, and the world is made up of a lot of different kinds of people. I have interest in telling their stories. Good morning, Cecilia. You don't have to say anything to me. Tom Griffin is a lawyer. I would call Adrian the puppeteer, and I would look at Tom as a puppet. I always imagine the idea of young kids traumatizing bugs or animals, and I imagine that Tom was that for Adrian. He just terrorized him, and now they've grown up, and they're still kind of doing the same thing. Adrian killed my sister, and you helped him. I can see you for what you really are. Uh, who are you? Do I know you? Do I owe you money? Who is James? James Lanier. You know, he's a single father, good man, working man. He's a police officer. Roll 
Holding boats, holding on. We are doing Aldous and I's first scene in the film. He's so professional and obviously, like, he's an incredible actor. Hopefully, I step in proper and I don't look foolish. Hey, see, he's not out there. I promise. Despite their very, very long relationship, James and City, they don't believe her, and that gets more and more frustrating to her. I wanted someone who was a bit of an audience surrogate who was seeing the movie through the perspective of normality, that this is crazy. And so I created this character called James, played by Aldous Hodge, who is someone she's living with. She feels like she's imposing on him just by crashing on his couch. And she tries to take care of James's daughter, Sydney, who's played by Storm Reid. It was really important to have that other perspective on what she was going through. Sydney is just a 15 or 16 year old girl who loves fashion, loves her dad. Cecilia acts as a mother figure to Sydney. Storm, she's doing things that I would never have even thought to do. She's so bright and so professional. Noise, action. <laughs> Got that. Very nice. Emily Cass, she hasn't got the vulnerability, certainly not on the surface, that Cecilia has. Can I start you off with some water? Just the free kind. OK, tap it is. Cool. She's a nice antidote to the softness that Elizabeth brings to Cecilia. You have a strength that I don't have. Mm-hmm. And I envy it. Sure. Please, show me your hand! I have to be honest, I just signed on to this movie because I thought it was just a really solid script and a great story, and Lizzie was going to be a part of it, and I'm a huge fan of her and her work. Ollie, seriously, you have to do a really difficult thing, which was step in and do the beginning of a film and an end of the film with not a lot in between. And to show an audience a character like that without a lot of material is actually really difficult. We didn't have any time. I met him the week before we started shooting. Lizzie was hugely helpful with offering up ideas, and we wanted to show the cycle of what these relationships are about, how people end up back in these relationships, even though they know better. It's about the pull of what these people do, specifically what Adrian does to grab them back. I remember we were talking to Lee when we were casting it, and one of the things we talked about was how important it was that this character was believable. He couldn't be twirling his mustache. He had to be somebody that you believe that this woman would be in a relationship with. He had to be a real person with that monster inside him. And Ollie really did hit the mark. I think we're all just super happy that we found him. It's such an amazing group of people that are involved in it. And it's such an incredible take on the story and something that is so exciting to be a part of it. You get a script called The Invisible Man, and, you know, obviously there's expectations there. It's called The Invisible Man, but it reads as this emotional drama and the story of a woman who is finding herself, finding her strength and finding her voice. Emily, where are you? I think what Lee tapped into is the emotional journey of this woman. He really did find something difficult to talk about and has been open to talking to me about it and me giving my own thoughts on what it's like from a female perspective. Adrian was a sociopath, completely in control of everything. Ah! Open the door! I think there are a lot of people that have dealt with invisible men in their lives, and these are real characters with real problems. That's what attracted me to the project. Oh, okay. It's not about something that you can't comprehend. It's not about something you can't wrap your mind around. Quietly now, and grow. Early on, Lee thought Elizabeth was perfect to do Invisible Man. Not. <laughs> if it weren't for her, the movie wouldn't be nearly as good as it is. She's the master of suspense. She can turn any emotion on. Hey, you okay? Stop, you okay? I'm okay. What? I'm okay, James. Look at me. He got his own throat. What did it sound like to you? Just really, really brilliant to watch. Oh, man, 
so we can't be too far across. The most physically challenging thing was the fight sequence that we did with the Invisible Man. I loved it when I read it, and so the pressure to do it justice is kind of huge. I've never done a moment like that, and I really wanted it to be cool. They wanted me to do as much of it as possible, although I had incredible assistance from my stunt double, Sarah. I had incredible stunt team here. Three, two, one, go! That was definitely, definitely really challenging. I felt I was pretty beat up the next day. <laughs> but it was fun, too, because it was also kind of cool and gratifying. <laughs> Okay, here we go. Probably the hardest thing emotionally to do was we shot the final scene the first week. So that was just a little bit of mind trip, trying to reverse engineer that and kind of think about what we wanted the final scene to be, which is this huge moment in the movie after all of this stuff has happened to Cecilia. <laughs> Please, please, you have to help me. He's trying to kill himself. You have to come as fast as you can. <laughs> please. Surprise. I'm very happy with it. I'm very proud of it. But that was definitely challenging because you're dealing with a lot of information that you don't have yet. So in a way, it was kind of cool because then we actually did know where we ended up. And it was a matter of just backing up from there. It's like full-on femme fatale stuff. <laughs> There you are. I see you! I see you! I take my work seriously, and I love what I do, but I don't take myself seriously. <laughs> I have a full knowledge of how lucky I am. Basically, I just pretend for a living. I think everyone who signed up for this knew that it wasn't going to be the easiest job in the world. People are here because they love the material, they love the job, and I feel like people believe in the character and it makes me want to keep going. I've, of course, been a big horror fan for a long time. I've been obsessed with horror movies all through my teenage years. I was a big fan of um, these iconic horror villains, you know, whether it's Freddy Krueger or you know, Pinhead. <laughs> and I was very much interested in making horror films and interested in how they worked. And when I was researching this movie and preparing to write it, I discovered that there's really not been many adaptations of the character. That was an exciting opportunity for me, you know. I felt I could do something new with it. Right now, we are in Gerringong, New South Wales. Beautiful Gerringong, as you can see. This is the first week. It's that strange time when you're learning to ride the bike again, like, oh yeah, this is how hard it is. Being a director, to me, feels like being a lion tamer. You're really not in control of anything. You just have a chair and a whip, and the film is the lion, and you're just hoping the lion doesn't get on top of you and rip your thorax out. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> I think I have to go now. Yeah. My assistant's just off camera. She wants me to leave. She's like, come on. <laughs> Let's hope this thing goes well. Um, yeah, I'm Lee. If you don't already know that, that's probably a bad sign. Um, I'm, the, I'm the director. I'm really excited. I don't get to do this very often because I'm a writer director. So at best, once every four years. So you'll have to forgive me if I get really excited. And the last thing I want to do is something I haven't worked out at all but I'm just gonna try and wing it. The prayer to the movie gods. So everyone needs to come in. Dear movie gods, please let the producers not get too angry when we're up to 37 takes. Just a Monday night. I'm not sure if I should be talking about this stuff, but we went over. And please let audiences like us because we're trying our best. One, two, three, go. Cut. Oh my god, a bunch of teenagers just lost their minds. <laughs> ah! One of them pulled their hoodie over their head. It's like, fuck that. Amen. Amen. All right, let's do this. Let's Woo! make a film. We're moving down to the track here. So, this is the exterior of Adrian's house in the film. And we're about to shoot an escape sequence, if you will. Action. Okay, cut, cut. 
Back to one. You know what? We need to yeah. start from the dead center. I don't want to move to the dead center. I want to be in the dead center. Oh yeah. Cut. Beautiful. Cut. Very nice. Very, very nice. What got me interested was the idea of doing a modernised version of The Invisible Man, how scary that could be. I felt like that hadn't been capitalised on properly yet in the way that I would like to see it, so here we are in Jeringal. All right, guys, first day's over. Thanks, everyone. Just uh, put your hand you. up if you're going to be returning tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> it reminded me what it's like to make movies, which is basically... Um, you know that moment in Raiders of the Lost Ark when Indiana Jones is running in front of the boulder? It's like that for a month. And uh, the first day reminded me of that. So um, ask me again tomorrow if I'm, how far in front of the boulder I'm getting. Thank you and good night. Okay, so this is day six and we are um, killing somebody. It's always good to spill some blood. I spilled a fair bit of blood in my career. I've snapped limbs, scalped people. Ripped teeth out, hacked my legs off at the ankle. Then, but um, this is special. There's something classier about this. So we said we're going to start with a knife up here, and then when we call action, do the cut. There's prosthetic effects involved. I'm a big fan of practical effects over digital effects, but it's scary because everything has to go right. But when it does go right, you feel the energy of the set get bigger. And action. One of the things that's deceptively difficult is finding locations that look like they could be the US. What you see is our best impression of a house in the US. I shouldn't be giving away the trade secrets. I, I want everyone who's watching this movie to think that it that we're in the US, but we're not. We just I spent milk three hours yeah, trying to find the right container for the milk. This yeah. is what you do all day. You ever wonder why it takes so long to make movies? Milk is the brother. <laughs> Tonight, we get to break some glass. This is all the effort you have to go to shatter one window in a film. But yeah, he really just runs at it. You know, it's like the car crash in Whiplash. Like, we can see it, but she can't. The audience will see something coming. And action. It's three o'clock in the morning here in Sydney. Tonight, it's a bit of a cat and mouse with the Invisible Man. And right up. There's a lot of elements, so you really have to try to remember what the edited film will be like to keep the suspense in mind. There's a large piece of equipment moving through. 90% of being on a film set is standing in the wrong place. Ratty, aren't they? Um, so this is a major street in Sydney that we have turned into a street in San Francisco. Look, it's an American taxi club. We're about to show some footage from the film to the crew to show them what they've been working on. It's usually a good motivator. It's usually weirdly nerve-wracking. It's kind of the first time you've shown it. There you go, so I think it went well. I think they liked it. They clapped at the end, so that's always a good sign. Today we're doing a big a sequence of someone being attacked. Elizabeth Moss, to be specific. We did it all with motion control, which is basically a robotic camera. But it's really, really difficult because with motion control, you have to work to account. 47. 
48. You need to do certain things at certain times because the camera will move when it's going to move. Here we go. And go. And 12. And 13. And 14. And you have to listen to the count while you're acting, which is a Herculean feat of multitasking that I could not achieve. But she just pulls it off. And 35, and 36, and 37, and 38, and 39, and 40, and 41. That's gonna be a main stop. Yeah, see? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, alright, good. That's the one. So we just tried to get a really <laughs> Impossible shot coming out of a moving car down the road into another moving car, all handheld, achieved by people physically handing the camera to other people. But I think we got a couple of good ones. We did a 20, 20 or so, 25 takes, and we're almost done. Seems like a thousand years ago that we had our first little chat, doesn't it? I reckon when you get out, if you just sort of bend down, almost like you're gonna puke, I think we'll really sell it. Right, one more, we're gonna go right into it. Okay, here we go. And three, two, one, action! So here I am, as you can see, the sun is rising over Sydney. Uh, we did that classic race the sun. Um, yeah, so it's a good feeling. It's always a good feeling on this moment. Everyone sort of comes together because the film set is a tense place. There's a lot of pressure to beat the clock, to get everything done. And then at the end, everyone just relaxes. You get to see people's true selves without being in a pressure cooker. But the journey has only just begun for me. Now I've got to cut it together. But I'm very happy with what I got. And uh, yeah, it's been, this has been a fun one. Very fun. So, see you soon. <laughs> Thank you.